there. Welcome to The Sacred Journey. The Sacred Journey reminds you that life is a wonderful adventure and each and every experience we have is a unique and perfect opportunity for learning. I'm Joyce St. Germain and tonight's topic, I want to be sure to get this right, Midlife Women's Sexual Health. The reason I wanted to be that specific is in the past 25 years I have covered a lot of topics this is the first time stepping into this topic, and I am so grateful to have with me Dr. Michelle Puglio, who's a naturopath in New Hartford, Connecticut. She's been a guest on a previous show. We're happy to have her back. Welcome back, Michelle. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks for having me back. Well, you and I are friends, and we have talked about this topic, and it's such a comfortable topic, and you're so well-versed and well-rounded and informed. I think most women have almost no knowledge of it. So thank you so much for coming and sharing. And I know this is not totally what your the focus of your practice is. Tell us a little bit more about your practice. Oh, I have a general practice. So I do see men and women. Uh, and But one of the places I really focus is in gynecology and uh, women's health issues around that. Uh, but I also digestive for both men and women, cardiovascular for both men and women. Uh, but. This is a, you know, I just turned 60 this year, uh, and my practice has matured with me. And so I would say a, a majority of my practice are women in our age group. Uh, and this is, this is an issue that I always ask women, you know, well, how's your sex drive? You know, and are you okay with having intimacy and your discomfort? And I can tell you, almost every woman will say, my sex drive isn't the same, my orgasms aren't the same, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. And so, yes, I've really done a lot of research and a lot of, uh, there are different, a lot of different approaches to help with that. And you um, earlier were telling me about the demographics and statistics. Yeah, you know, Amazing. we were saying, well, why is this so much more apparent, you know, as far as TV and advertisements? And so I looked at the demographics. So by 2020, there'll be 333 million uh, people in the U.S. And at least 33% of them will be 50 years old and older. So a third of the U.S. population will be 50 years old and older. And 53% of them will be women. So this is a huge demographic. It's a huge demographic. Uh, and it's one that pharmaceutical industry, medical industry is focusing on. And this is why I don't have a TV. But when I travel and I watch TV at night, I'm amazed at the amount of commercials that are addressing some of the factors of this. And not in a necessarily welcoming way. If I were a woman and I was watching what they were saying, take this and do that so, it's, um, so intimacy is tolerable or not painful, I'm not sure their approach is all that welcoming. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. And <clears throat> from... from some of the, I find some of the commercials uh, really misleading. Uh, my favorite one is this very handsome man in his you know, 60s or something, and he says, you know, I take Cialis, which is one of the drugs for erectile dysfunction, so I'm ready for my woman anytime she wants me. And I'm like, wait a minute here. This is a fantasy, because most women who come to me say, I'm worried about this. I don't have the drive I used to have. I love my partner still. I still find them attractive but I'm just not as interested, you know. And so women see this commercial and say, what? Other women want their guys all the time still? And other men say, what? Their women or their partners want them all the time still? You know, so it's a very misleading commercial. And I would imagine it could even bring up some fear, like, oh, I'm going to be replaced by a younger version because I'm not with that same level of physical interest. Yeah, uh, there, there is that. Uh, and I actually, that's, for some women, it's very challenging because they are having some discomfort. Uh, their male partner is using one of these products, Levitra, Cialis, and the other one is the first, Viagra. Okay. Um, and now he's wanting to be more active more often and for longer periods of time. And she's saying, yikes, I can't. I can't do that like I did in my 20s or 30s. And those are natural changes in the body. It's a natural it is absolute. That's a really important point to make, is that 
when our bodies are high on hormones, that will override a lot of the mental processes that would distract us from having sex. When our bodies are designed to procreate, driving us, driving us on uh, to have children, even for those of us who don't have children, the drive is still there. When we go through menopause, our hormones drop a lot, and it makes perfect sense that we no longer have such a strong drive. I mean, it's natural. We're not being called to bear children. We're anymore. not being called to bear children. Men, on the other hand, can father children until they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> really. Let's hope they don't. But well, that's, okay. Yes. Yes. So, um, I, I really reassure women about this. That, as I say, almost every woman I see in our age group, mid forties and beyond, are saying, "What is going on here?" And mm -hmm. I'm 65, so we're you know kind yeah. of within the same range. And I notice a personal difference, and in conversation with friends, there's a difference. And some of it's emotional and psychological, physical, hormonal. What kind of changes are happening in women besides hormonal changes that are, when I say hormonal changes, I'm talking about menopause and the hot flashes and the, the outward signs of it. What else is happening in a woman's body that's changing as she's getting a little older in regards to... Well, I think both men health. and women's bodies, one of the challenges is that um, we really have to work to be as flexible. Uh, and so we're getting a little stiffer and a little less range of movement, you know, which uh, you and I oh, both know. Oh, you mean know. flexible. I'm flexible. thinking you mean... I mean physically flexible. flexible and compromise and so, but you mean you know, flexible. No, no, physically okay. flexible. And so they have to take that into account, uh, that some of the positions and things I like to do is maybe not such a great idea. So change um, is good. Change is good. I <clears throat> I invite people to think about, I'm not a counselor, and so if there's really issues around this, emotional issues around this, I really do recommend that my patients see. There are um, ASECT, which is the American Society for Sexual Education, Counseling, and Therapy. They do... Um, uh, educational programs and they license basically therapists who are sexuality counselors or therapists. And, and their, their specialty is helping with the emotional issues in this transition. But I will tell women that, look, what you really, and, and this is as much as I'll talk about this because I really want to get to the physical things we can talk about because I want women to, uh, and men, to get some uh, things that they can do already right away to help things be better. Uh, but the main thing is to realize that we don't feel like we did in our 20s and 30s. And if couples are in established relationships, they really have to come to a new reality and create a new way of intimacy that satisfies them both. Because it's very different uh, for women when they don't have all that hormone on board. Things that worked before may not work now, and other things will. Um, so it's, uh, it's really about creating this new intimacy. And I've got to say that I do have couples in my practice that are in their 70s and beyond who do have satisfying intimate relationships. And they'll tell me that it doesn't always necessarily require an orgasm or penetration. But there's an intimacy that really brings them, you know, heart open and close together. And it has to be a co-creation. So I love Christiane Northrup's um, uh, quote on this. Christiane Northrup wrote, Our bodies, ourselves. No, women's, women's, women's body, women's wisdom. She says, the best thing you can do to improve your sex life is to get a new partner, and that new partner is you. And so uh -huh. I agree with this. I think, you know, uh, rather than focus on how do we get it to be the way it was, uh, that, you know, that the women and their partners, they really need to think about how can we really make this work for us. That's really satisfying. And it's interesting to know how many women have no idea of who they are um, sexually and intimately, but even physically. A, a lovely little exercise. Uh, I, I've gone to an ASECT conference. I've done a, um, three levels of pelvic floor physical training uh, to help women with pelvic floor problems uh, because the other thing that women are dealing with at this time that's advertised everywhere is urinary leakage, yeah. which, you know, I see all these advertisements for pads and sexy depends, you know, and they're modeled by much younger women, by the way. Um, so a lot of pelvic floor, we, you know, I do a lot, of, a lot of that work with my patients too. But I love this exercise. It's an exercise where partners 
um, and a, just an outline of a human body, a partner marks what they think their partner's erotic spots are, their most erotic <laughs> spots, right? Interesting. Uh, and so then, then they show each other, and sometimes it's very interesting that, oh, I didn't know behind your knees is special, or, you know, behind your ear, or, you know, it's... Communication. Communication, yeah. and, and kind of fun, yeah. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> You, we, you and I had a great chance to talk as we were preparing for this and to throw some ideas around. And I loved your attitude that you are deepening, a re one is deepening a relationship with this new phase of their life. That just said it all for me. What do you mean by that? Well, as I said, uh, it's an opportunity for, if someone's not in a couple, to understand themselves even more, who they are. I mean, I have some women who, uh, you know, say, you know, I'm not in a relationship, but I don't like feeling like I don't want to have an orgasm anymore. Or if I try to have an orgasm, it's not the same. Or, you know, what can I do about that? Uh, and then as in, in couple relationships, it's such an opportunity to say, well, what's what's really going on here? And how, how do we want to, to, to create this intimacy in the rest of our lives? How important is that to us? And for some couples, that's not that important. A physical relationship like that is not that important. You know, so, but that should be clarified. And that should be agreed to, or they should certainly have like feelings about it. To be because if they don't talk about it, you know, I've had patients say to me, you know, my partner is worried that, you know, that I don't love them anymore, or I don't find them attractive anymore, and that's not the reality. It's just that I don't have the same feelings. Back to communication. Yeah. Um, what is the role of hormones, or what could the role of hormones be in all of this? When I say hormones, hormone treatment or some type of treatment. So especially with concerns for having um, penetration and intercourse. For women, uh, one of the major effects is that without all that hormone on board, the tissue of the vagina uh, becomes uh, drier and less stretchy. We're producing less of our normal secretions. And so with that, then, penetration can become very uncomfortable. And <clears throat> so uh, with hormones, uh, and thankfully there's been uh, some really great studies uh, that came out in 2017 and just recently that vaginal estrogens are very safe for women. Uh, the studies showed that uh, women who used vaginal estrogens did not have higher risk for breast cancer, endometrial cancer, colorectal cancer, strokes, or... Um, or blood clots. Not only that, they went on to show that women who used vaginal estrogens, let me think about this, they had fewer broken bones, they had, I think, fewer urinary tract infections, and they had less uh, all other causes of death in that five years of study. Interesting. What does this mean? Yeah. Again, that intimacy, I mean, ARP says that couples who have sexually satisfying relationships live longer. Well, so, so do couples who have dogs, but, you know, so if you do so both, you're covered. You're, you're covered, yeah. You know, that makes sense because intimacy is such a, a beautiful aspect of life right. if, if you're fortunate enough to have an intimate partner. Right. Um, what does the overall health of a person, men and women, have to say about their sexual health. Right, well cardiovascular is very important because uh, orgasm requires a good cardiovascular system. Uh, and this is why something like Cialis or Levitra helps because it helps the, the circulation maintain that direction. Well, women have that too. I mean, the clitoris is more than just that little thing that's seen. There's a whole behind uh, the scenes in the Lady Minora, a part of that whole uh, clitoral mechanism. So cardiovascular health, neurological health, the nerves are involved, musculoskeletal, you know, if a woman has or a man has low back problems or hip rotation problems, all that comes into play. But uh, the thing that I, that I see the most, has the most uh, effect on this is um, vaginal, the vaginal vault and the condition there. That really affects women. Women definitely get the brunt more of ageism uh, in society than men do. Uh, and that can affect our whole self-esteem as, as being central beings. 
Uh, and that's why, you know, to have a, a partner who loves you and uh, wants to, to have this, this intimate, this intimacy is important. I'm going to do a few clinical pearls. Okay. So, uh, lubricants are important. And the type of lubricant couples are using is important. So, it turns out, I'm an ex-biochemist, as you know, uh, that... I have forgotten, thank you for yes, reminding so, me. Yes, um, so, it turns out the osmolality, so how much chemical how much chemicals are in the, the, the lubricant solution, makes a difference. And so, things that, it should have the same osmolality as normal vaginal secretions. KY products have very high osmolality. It's not a good thing to use there. It will actually pull fluid into the vault, the vaginal vault, but dry out the tissue. So that's not a good choice. Uh, one of my favorite things to recommend is coconut oil. So the same coconut oil you cook with. And you know, if it's a solid, it's really convenient for women just to take a little chunk of that and pop it up there, and it's a great lubricant. So I recommend that. Um, also, there's a product line called Slickwid. So, Slick Wit. Very clever. Clever. Clever yeah, Slick Wit. Okay. Great line of products. Um, it's made from seaweed, aloe, and a little bit of silicone. Makes it very slippery. Um, and that can be very helpful. And <clears throat> women, some, I, I do prescribe some vaginal estrogens, uh, hormones. They're in little cocoa butter suppositories. They have estriol, which is the mildest estrogen, a little progesterone, a little DHEA. But Kegel, is actually contracting the floors of the pelvic, the pelvic bowl uh, in such a way, like when women or men are trying to, st men can do Kegels too. Um, so uh, when women are peeing, when they uh, oh, they gotta start peeing because you know, the phone is ringing or something, or somebody's coming in the room or whatever, you know, it's that feeling, you're, you're pulling those muscles up and in. Well, it's not just for the pelvic floor, it pumps lymphatics, it pumps the circulation, we all should be doing uh, good Kegels, a set of five of them twice a day. But I can tell you from doing hundreds of exams, probably thousands of exams in my 28 years, that not every woman knows how to do it. And I'm really grateful that you are so well informed, but so candid and so down to earth about it, because it's not a comfortable topic for people to ask about or to listen to. And I'm you know, so glad our viewers are So many women welcoming. are so relieved to know it's not just them that's in this situation of like, what is going on here? It's, and it's, it is everyone, almost everyone is dealing with, you know, some aspect of this that they want to, I don't want to say heal because it's not a pathology, but they want things to be better. When we were speaking on the phone yesterday, you said something that I went, huh. You said that when someone starts a relationship, a new relationship in their later years or after their 40s or midlife, sometimes there's something really wonderful about it because there isn't this comparison to how it used to the be. Past. You've said it so much better. Do you want to? So uh, for, for women who are postmenopausal, perimenopausal, if they're starting with a new partner, then uh, this new partner is meeting them with at the, who they are right now. And, and, that, and so they're able to build on that. If someone's been in a relationship for 30 years and the other partner doesn't understand the changes that are happening, this disconnect happens. You know, so it's, as I said, it's really about connecting on a much deeper level for couples who've been together for a long time to create this new, intimate, sensual relationship. Yeah, that was so nice to hear because then there's no, well, you used to enjoy that and we used to have, you know, sex so many times a week or whatever. So there isn't any, but it used to, and that desire to have it the way it used to. I loved how you put that. That was really nice. And, um, you know, as a person who met my, my love later in life and a lot of friends, the same thing, it was wonderfully liberating to hear that and it was really... It was nice, so thank you for oh, sharing that. You're welcome. I appreciated that. I would say this about prevention of urinary tract infections then. Okay. That <clears throat> it's important um, after uh, women have had sex that uh, they always rinse down with cool water. Sit on the toilet, use a water bottle as a spout, and just rinse down with cool water. Um, if the tissue is swollen and you know, there's secretions there that can throw off the pH, uh, that can really be a good preventative. Also, a lot of probiotics now are designed for women. 
um, they'll say a women's probiotic. And what that means is that they have two specific lactobacillus in there, lactobacillus rhamnosus and lactobacillus ruteri. Who names these things? I don't know. <laughs> um, but those two particular lactobacilli can really be help, help to be preventative for urinary tract infections. So that's something I would say. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that I'm very excited about the gastrointestinal work that I'm doing uh, with uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and uh, which is a totally different topic, except if someone has IBS with diarrhea, um, and a woman, then she's more prone to UTIs. So there's, there is a crossover a little bit there, but it turns out that IBS, which is the most common complaint that patients go to, to gastroenterologists, but more than 50%, go to a gastroenterologist and say, I, I think I have IBS. I never go to the bathroom the same way. I, can, I have to know where every bathroom is, or I can't go for days in a row. And it turns out that at least 60% of that is something called SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, and it's really just coming into um, the conventional gastroenterology world. Um, there are some local gastroenterologists who are beginning to look at it and treat it. Um, but thankfully, it also responds really well to naturopathic needs. Yeah. Okay, and you've promised that you will come, I'll come and back share and... this in depth. Yes. So, because we're in your office now in New Hartford, and we will give all your contact information at the end of the show, so okay. people can contact you for more information. Okay. Because I could sit here for hours and hours and hours and pick your brain about everything, and sometimes I feel like I do, like I'm always asking questions. And I think you're a wonderful resource for people, and you know I thank you for sharing all well, of this. Well, thanks knowledge. for taking this topic on, Joyce. You know, and I said, listen, I want to talk about sexual health, women, midlife women's sexual health. It, it, this has to be a, a topic that women are more comfortable to talk among themselves and with their their physicians and health practitioners, and uh, because everyone is dealing with this in some aspect. Well, thank so, you thanks. for being inviting because it was a topic that I saw, thought, you know, our viewers would benefit from this. Men, women, in relationship, not relationship, in heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual relationships. Everyone needs to know who they are in a, a sexual way and in an intimate mm -hmm. way and make the most out of the relationships they have with others or themselves to, to live a joyful life, to really be and able a to longer enjoy. life. According to AARP. That's right. Yes. So, <laughs> adopt a dog, have a healthy sexual um, relationship, or even if it's with relationship. yourself. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, we have lots to talk about in the future. So, thanks so right. much for sharing your it was wisdom my pleasure. and insight. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the Sacred Journey. We'll catch you next time.